Yes, you are welcome to thank Laura Long for that beautiful prelude this morning. It is a joy. It is a joy to welcome our students, faculty, staff, and even some special guests to chapel on this Monday morning. Today is the first of two special days of lectures, the Christian Action Commission Lectures. This is the second year that we have been able to host these lectures sponsored by the Christian Action Commission of the Mississippi Baptist Convention. The goal of these lectures is to have a place and a time at a Christian university when a biblical worldview and Christian ethics for our world today are discussed. We are very thankful for the opportunity to host these lectures and we are delighted that you're here. Today and tomorrow's chapel are unusual in that they are extended chapels. We will not be dismissed at uh, 1030 today. Our guest speaker will have additional time as he explains a biblical worldview. We're especially glad to have Dr. Kenny Digby, who is the executive director treasurer of the Christian Action Commission, here with us today. And he is going to come and give our invocation and say a few.
especially you all, because uh, like Dr. Digby said, and like I'm sure you've heard people will say, it wasn't that long ago before I was sitting where you are sitting today. But you know, it's really true, and it goes by so quickly.
country allowed Jesus to be the Lord and the foundation, as our nation certainly did. Now it says this, Psalm 166, yes. the boundary lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a godly heritage. Folks, let me uh, set aside academia for a moment and speak to you if I were your youth pastor. I was youth pastor for 11 years and still love it. You know, uh, maybe some of you are called to full-time ministry. But here's the thing. I, I counsel with people that are very often in adulthood, and they're still struggling with areas of their life they wouldn't let go and lay at the feet of Jesus years ago. See, the Bible says this, and let's be very clear. There's a Savior. There's a God who loves us, but there's also an enemy. Uh, John 10, verse 10, speaking of Satan, says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. See, the devil is after you. You need to know that. Satan has two plans. Plan A, that you live and die without having put your faith in Christ. You said, well, I'm a Christian, Alex. I'm, I'm a believer. Satan will revert to plan B. Even if you're a born-again believer, the devil will try to tempt you, discourage you, get you off the, uh, the path. The devil will try to convince you that you don't need to be in church. You can do this kind of, you know, free agent style. The devil will try to convince you that you don't really need to read the word and daily follow after Christ. And Satan has caused many a Christian to squander their potential and what they could have done to experience the blessing of God and do things that count for eternity. And so, Blue Mountain, I come to you this morning at a time that I'm sure you've heard preachers talk about, you know, to be saved and to grow. And, and we can talk about that, and that's important. But I want to appeal to you this morning with everything that my heart can convey. I want to cry out to you and ask you if you would step up and be something that our world and our nation so desperately need at this moment. That you would be an individual who knows who you are. You would be an individual who knows who God is. And you would be an individual who knows about this wonderful thing called the United States of America. I've studied our nation for decades. I love this country. I, I think about when I was one of my first trips to a third world country. And it's been our joy with our ministry to go around the world and do Christian events. I remember I was in uh, South America preaching. We saw over 50,000 people come to Christ in a two-week period. But little villages, and you had to really step over, step over the human waste just coursing down the mountainsides because they didn't have plumbing or infrastructure or, or wells. And I think about the fact that all around the world, I think about when I was in Zambia for the first time, and we were in mud huts and grass roofs, and one of the pastors in Zambia asked me, he said, have you ever ridden in a, an automobile? Ridden in an automobile? I've got three at home, you know? I uh, felt kind of convicted. All right, folks, America, because not here, but in so many schools where I've spoken, Harvard, Yale, Duke, Chapel Hill, Texas A&M, Florida State. Uh, God's allowed me to be in a lot of schools. A uh, University of uh, Toronto, uh, 50,000 students. And I was in an auditorium of 5,000 students literally screaming at me, giving me the middle finger. That's okay, I'm weird. I, great peace comes over me whenever that happens. Um, <laughs> You ought to get into apologetics and biblical worldview. You'll, you'll be able to go places and share Jesus, sometimes in some really interesting circumstances. But I've stood on many a stage, and I've listened to professors and students trash America. America is evil. America is bad. Burn it down. We need to become socialists. And I'm appealing to you to understand how great and how blessed this nation is and why we must defend it. And we must defend, among other things, the fact that we were and are founded on a Christian foundation. 
Now, one last little illustration, and I'm going to read some points that I hope to convey. We had a missions conference in North Carolina a couple of years ago, and I had a couple of pastors from Ethiopia come. And in conjunction with some other Christian organizations, we raised money, and we flew these pastors in. Well, they, they landed in Greensburg, North Carolina on a Sunday morning, 7 a.m., and so we decided uh, we got to get them some breakfast, right? There's nothing open on a Sunday morning, really, but a grocery store was open. So these two pastors from Ethiopia, amazing men of God, tall, very, very thin. I mean, imagine uh, they were so skinny, it was like broomsticks strung together. But we go to just, we're headed to this church, and I see a grocery store is open, right? So we wheel into this grocery store, and they think, well, I, I will get them a, a, a muffin and some orange juice or something. Common, nothing special at all about this grocery store. And these two Ethiopian men, they've been on American soil just a matter of moments. They're like dumbstruck, looking around. And I said, what do you want? I'll get you a bagel, I'll get you a muffin, anything you want. And at the end of a, an aisle was a, a box of frosted flakes, right? Cereal. And he's looking at this like it's a, a, a moon rock or something from another universe. And he looks at me and listen carefully to the question that this Ethiopian pastor asked him. He said, is, is there a food repository like this in every city? I said, watch this. And he looked down the aisle and there were 300 boxes of cereal and every, I said, brother, there's a food repository like this on just about every corner. And these guys, one guy is counting on his fingers. He said, this would feed our village for years. Now here's my point. If you don't have to watch a lot of news and media to hear people trashing America. I love America. I know America was founded, our uh, Declaration, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, 50 out of 50 state constitutions reference God, Jesus, or Christianity, or the Bible. I know our nation was steeped in biblical worldview thought and is, but yet here's the thing, people from other countries very often know more about America and love America even more deeply than natural born Americans. I mean, you think about it, we are so blessed, not only in the world today, but in the scheme of world history. There's no other nation, all oh, brothers and sisters, hear me, there's no other nation that has offered liberty, freedom, stability, prosperity. And, and 200 years ago, it didn't exist. Uh, across the stage of world history, there have been several methods of government. Monarchy, which can also be dictatorial. You've got a king, the divine right of kings. And one of the things that the founders believed about America was, now listen to this. Um, you, you've often heard in the news they'll say that the president is the commander in chief of the armed forces. But you know, a president cannot declare war without the consent of Congress. And the founders really wanted accountability and balance so that no one person would unilaterally make decisions because the founders said one of the ways that monarchs have uh, most consistently impoverished their people is by involving themselves in unnecessary wars. And uh, you, you know that Lincoln, when he spoke at Gettysburg, and I've been there, I would urge you to go there in uh, near Shippensburg, Pennsylvania, but there is government of the people, by the people, and for the people with the consent of the government. I mean, we're $34 trillion in debt, and just last week, uh, the, the government decided that there would be a $95 billion financial package that doesn't even address border security and so you and I, we are paying more than we should have to pay. The grocery store, we're in this uh, intolerable, poor economy because we have, to a degree, forgotten a lot of our concepts, not the least, which is the idea of consent of the government.
But here's my point. You can make a difference to restore this nation that so desperately needs to recover its biblical foundations. Now, the, the founders understood we don't want to be a monarchy. That's a king and a dictator. We don't want to be an oligarchy. That's uh, a small group that acts as a king. We don't want to be a democracy. Folks, we are not a democracy. Over and over, and this is very intentional because socialists are very, very careful in the way they commandeer language. They'll say, January 6th uh, jeopardized our democracy. Democracy has never been jeopardized because we're not a democracy. Plato, in his Republic, 2,000 years ago, wrote about the fact, and many have elaborated on this, that democracy is, without a moral foundation, it is mob rule. So, what are we? America, and this, if you really get your mind around what this represents, it's worth turning cartwheels of joy over. We are a Judeo-Christian representative republic. Now, what does that mean? Just like in the church, elders meet with a pastor, the prayer team. Uh, we are, you may not know this. Our form of government is based on the Presbyterian church. And there are godly men, just like Jethro told Moses, appoint godly people to help make decisions and bear the weight of leadership. And it is genius across the stage of human history. Besides the fact that America has had unparalleled prosperity, unparalleled technological achievement, we have, in terms of a stable government, we have had an unparalleled amount of success. And that's why we are the second most important nation in world history. Now, let's put the slide up. Go to the one with these points. I realize this font is probably too small. I'm going to read this for you uh, because it's probably too small to see. But I want to make five points, and I will continue these throughout tomorrow. Number one, that America is based on Christianity. But here's the thing. Christianity, the most influential worldview in history, today is largely misunderstood. Christianity is not be good, be nice, be sweet. So that's what the world says. Right now there's a documentary by Rob Reiner, and he's an atheist, he's a famous filmmaker, but it, it basically is slamming Christian nationalism. Now hang with me, and I'm going to come back to this slide. But let me just say this. To be a Christian means you have put your faith in Jesus, the risen Son of God. Be a Christian means you're a disciple. Now in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the risen Lord Jesus said that we are to do all things that he commanded. Now, what did the Savior command? That we are to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that we are to become more and more Christ-like, that we are to love our neighbor, but that doesn't mean that we are just to agree with anything and everything. The Bible says that we are to warn the sinner of their sin and of impending judgment. The Bible says that we're to be good stewards. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. The Apostle Paul says, you're not your own. So look, your skills, your abilities, your life, your opportunities, that's something God has entrusted to you. I want to challenge you. Listen, going to one of the nation's great Christian universities, it's an honor. I want to challenge you to always try to make an A as a worship offering for God. I was a C student. My, my mom, she was a public school teacher 28 years. She was always like, son, you can do better. And I said, mom, anything above a C is a waste of time. That was a terrible attitude, right? But when I got saved midway through my undergrad program, and I realized well, not everybody gets to go to college, God's blessed me. And, and I remember I, I would walk through my door. God changed my whole perspective. And as a new believer, I was starting a fall semester because I, I really gave my life to the Lord midsummer. And I was walking through this class, and I looked at the door frame, 
And I said, Lord, if you'll help me, I'm going to make an A. And I never made an A on anything, Dr. McMillan. Uh, but I said, Jesus, if you're going to help, if you'll help me, my grave will be a worship offering back to you. And then I never made but one more B in my whole life. And that was in six semester Greek. And uh, uh, you make a B in that, that's pretty good. But here's my point. You and I, if you're a born-again believer, everything is about stewardship. You have a stewardship of your time. By the way, time is a non-renewable resource. Money, you can get more money, but you can't get more time. Every minute you waste is an unrecoverable loss. So use your time wisely. Your mind, your ability. Now, you know, none of us are Einstein, but we are who we are. And we have a responsibility to God to do something with our mind. The opportunity to come here, to graduate from Blue Mountain. What a glorious privilege this is. Don't blow it, right? All right, so we're to be stewards. Now, five points, and we're going to be done in a moment for today. Christianity, the most influential worldview in history, is very much misunderstood, even by those who profess to be Christians. Point number two, America, the second most influential nation in history, second only to Israel under King Solomon, America is in dire jeopardy today. It is. And God is raising up you and all of us to speak truth and be used by God to restore our nation. Third, the two most overlooked facts about America are this. Number one, the role of Christianity. Number two, the basing of government and culture on natural law. That's morality. And I'll talk more about what natural law is. You may not realize this, but trust me. You know, it's like you go to get your car worked on and you've not even thought about your transmission. You think you just needed an oil change. And the mechanic says, you don't know this, but you've got way bigger problems than your oil change. You're gonna, you better get your transmission fixed or you're gonna be stranded. See, I'm gonna say this, unless you're a political science major, you don't know it, you don't know this, but the most important thing about your freedom and future possibility of prosperity is natural law. That's moral. We'll come back to that. Fourth, the legality of and benefit of religion in culture today is being ignored and very often actively suppressed. And the fifth thing, the assumption that socialism is inevitable and desirable, we have got to stand against it. Now there are three words I've grouped together on this slide. Statism, that's that the government becomes the God. Socialism, which is really Marxism. And look, all of these uh, benefits that you and I are paying for, free tuition, free medical care, free cell phones to illegals, that is unjust. And the, the idea that, uh, as Hillary Clinton said when she was running for president, we forcibly confiscate the earnings of one group and redistribute without any recourse or say to another group, that's socialism and that is wrong and for 200 years plus, absolutely antithetical to what America was about. And then progressivism. See, there, there's this resignation and, and, and I'll, I'll close today by, by saying that I've met a lot of Christians over the years and they'll say, well, you know, Brother Alex, my home is in heaven. And I guess the world's going to go the way it goes. See, the world, the flesh, the devil, those three enemies of God, a, a, a fallen world system, the, the sin nature, Satan himself, they all would like the church to throw up our hands and give up and say, let's just, let's just hang in there till we die and go to heaven. I want to challenge you to get into the spirited contest, uh, the battle for truth. 
Because the Spirit of the living God is with you. The Scriptures affirm what you and I are about as the church. People need Jesus. We have this free America that has done more. My goodness, 6,000 years of recorded history. And suddenly, two centuries ago, there appeared on the horizon uh, a, a nation conceived that, first of all, our basic fundamental presupposition that there is a God. God created you. God endowed you with certain inalienable rights. JFK in January of 61, when John F. Kennedy was being inaugurated, and Reagan repeated this, and so did President Bill Clinton, quoting JFK. The rights of man come not from government, but from God. The role of government is not to give you rights, but to guard the rights you already have by God, your maker. And that's why when Jefferson wrote the declaration and, and a small group of East Coast farmers, mostly with sticks and rocks, they were the Minutemen, they fought the world's strongest navy and army, the King of England. How, how audacious that they believed they could be free and build a Christian nation. But you know what they said? Jefferson wrote it. He said, appealing to God for the rectitude of our intentions. In other words, if we're in the wrong, we'll answer to God about it. But I want to say this as I close today. If we don't respond to the offer of salvation, if we don't acknowledge the reality of stewardship to live our life gratefully obedient to our Savior, and if we don't rise up to the preservation of the United States of America, and that involves every last one of us, then God will judge our intentions or lack thereof. Oh, God loves you. God has things for you. But I want to challenge you, Blue Mountain, to do what is so urgently needful that you pray for our nation, that you equip yourself, follow your path that God has laid out, those boundary lines of Psalm 16, 6. Medicine, business, education, ministry, athletics, the arts, whatever. You have a call on your life, every one of you. There's not one soul in this room that doesn't have a roadmap that God has written out, if you're willing. But it must include the ethic of citizenship. Christianity built America. Christianity is why we're a great nation. It hangs in the balance these days. We must, with God's help and for His glory, see it restored. I hope you're in. I hope you're with me. I want to pray, and we'll reconvene tomorrow. Let me pray. If our heads could be bowed, our eyes closed. If you've never trusted Christ, then by all means, put your faith in Jesus. If you need help understanding that, come see me. I'll be down front. But Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask for your intervention for our nation. I thank you for these students. I thank you for the faculty and administration. And Lord, we thank you for what Blue Mountain has represented for a century and a half. And I pray in the name of Jesus for your great commission, for the freedom to serve and share the gospel, and for the opportunity to glorify you with the way we live our lives. Father God, again, cleanse us. Fill us, send us, use us. And dear Jesus, may our ways and ultimately our nation be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.